Thank you for joining me today as we talk about the impacts of trauma on our community. Specifically, we're talking about the impacts of trauma on the brains of children, which is known as developmental trauma. I would like to point out um, that this uh, presentation was developed by Dr. Melissa Saden of Ducks and Lions, as well as input from me, Tracy Heisler, from CASA of Somerset, Hunterdon, and Warren Counties. So perspective is important. As you look at this picture, think about what it is that you see. Some people see two faces looking at one another. Others see a face that's cut in half. Some people see a vase in the middle of the two. How about here? Is this young man looking at you or is he looking sideways? And here's the FedEx logo. There's a hidden message in here that many people don't know or don't see, but in between the E and the X, there's an arrow, which would suggest to you that your packages are going to get where you want them to go. And what about this young man? As you look at him, think about um, what it is that you see. What can you uh, glean about him from this photo? It's clear that he's wearing a Halloween costume He's got some ghouls in the back. He has his hands on his hips. Some have a, a, a impression that his face is, go away, mom, hurry up, take the picture. Why are we here? Um, it may surprise you to learn that this young man is actually one of the Columbine shooters. And he um, had been himself a victim of trauma in childhood. And looking at him, who would know the impacts over his life that the trauma that he experienced would have and on the impacts of the, his classmates and his teachers and ushering in this new wave of shootings here across the country. So the federal government has increasingly recognized the importance of understanding the impacts of trauma and have declared uh, a, a public health emergency. So according to SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and mental health wing of the federal government, a trauma in, to be trauma informed is to recognize that it realize that trauma exists, to recognize the impacts of it, to respond in a trauma informed way, and to resist the urge to re-traumatize someone. So we're in this presentation, we're going to look at each of these four variables and hope that it helps to give you a better understanding of what being trauma informed is. So what is trauma? For some, it's a single event, something like a car accident, Hurricane Sandy, a robbery, your house burns down. These are single event traumas which can lead over time to post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. What we're talking about today is different. We're talking about developmental trauma and it can come up over several different domains in a child's life. There could be physical, sexual, or emotional abuse. There could be poverty in their home. There could be neglect, cultural or intergenerational um, practices that are maladaptive. There could be separation from parents, family violence. The difference between single event trauma and developmental trauma is that this occurs in childhood and is prolonged over time. Now please recognize that there's not just one source of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. They can come from any number of different um, foundational issues. We looked at some in the previous slide of things that were happening in the home. There could also be things in the community like uh, violence, structural racism, exposure to toxins, um, inadequate housing. There could also be things in the environment and we're see, as we see these uh, impacts of natural disasters like hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, um, and now with changes in climate, we're seeing more severe storms than we've seen in the past. So how do we know about the prevalence of trauma in our community for children? In 1977, 1997, uh, there was a, an insurance company known as Kaiser Permanente in California that recognized that it was paying out a, an 
extraordinary amount of, of their premiums to obesity related issues. So they wanted to understand what was the driver in this for the people that they were insuring. So they hired two epidemiologists named Anda and Folletti and asked them to do a really comprehensive study about the foundational issues within um, the obesity epidemic. So Anda and Folletti had 17,000 um, students that they were collecting histories on and they found that there was a correlation between those with obesity related issues and those with um, child abuse histories. And this was new information. So they came off of the obesity study and decided to pursue adverse childhood experiences or ACEs study. So they looked at three domains, abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction, and specifically physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, and then within the household, mental illness, somebody who'd been incarcerated, domestic violence, substance abuse, and divorce. An 11th ace of poverty has since been added to this. So Anda and Folletti administered this um, survey, and this is what they found. Anda and Folletti found that 36% of the people that they surveyed, a little more than one out of three, had zero aces. 26% had one, 16% had two, 9% had three, and 12% had four or more ACEs. So we know from this data that roughly one in four children have experienced three or more ACEs over the lifespan. A new study came out in 2018 that was uh, quite expansive with more than 214,000 participants and their outcomes found uh, very similar data to Anna and Folletti, that one in four adults had three or more ACEs in childhood. However, the numbers were significantly increased in these three subcategories. For children or adults looking retrospectively as children, if they were black, Hispanic, or multiracial, if they were bisexual, gay, or lesbian, or they came from households where they, the caregivers hadn't finished high school, made less than $15,000 a year, were unemployed or unable to work, those ACEs increased significantly. So this is a really great graphic from Indiana State Department of Health that gives you a really good overview about the, the impacts of ACEs over the lifespan. So if you look at the bottom, if there's a generational issues within a family and there's a history of trauma within a family, that can lead to a, a structure within the family where there's social constraints. There maybe there's poverty, maybe there's mental health issues, maybe there's substance abuse, which can lead to adverse childhood experiences in the home. Those adverse childhood experiences can lead to this disrupted neurodevelopment, which we're gonna look at um, in a minute, which can increase social and emotional and cognitive impairments which can lead to the adoption of risk, health, risk behaviors over the lifespan, which can lead to disease, disability, and social problems, which can lead to an early death. There is some data that would suggest that people with three or more ACEs um, live an average of 20 years fewer, die 20 years sooner than their peers. So, one in four kids are traumatized in every classroom in the United States. What do we do about that? So let's look at the overall impact of adverse childhood experiences on children's health and well-being. We know that high ACE scores and the stress associated with it can reduce your ability to respond, to learn, and to problem solve. It can lower your stress tolerance and lead to fighting, checking out, or acting defiantly which can increase your difficulty in making friends and maintaining relationships. We also know that the stress associated with high ACE scores can increase problems with learning and memory, which can be permanent. They can increase stress hormones, which affect the, uh, the body's ability to fight infection. It can also increase your risk of drug and alcohol use or overeating. It can also cause lasting health problems. So here's the wheel of doom that came out of Anda and Folletti's research. We know that 
for every uh, ace that you have, the higher the percentage is of the probability of you developing these things over the lifespan without intervention. So this particular, uh, this particular data is based on three aces. So it can go up with every ace that you have in addition. So for individuals with three or more aces, they have a 21.3% increased chance of alcohol or heavy drinking. 25.5% increased risk of cardiovascular disease. 24.3% increased risk in cancer almost 33% increase in separation or divorce, 67% increase in general life dissatisfaction, 61% increase in a mental health condition, 42.5% increase in hopelessness, 42.7% increase in a mental health condition that requires medication, 55.7% increase in anxiety, and a 58.9% increase in HIV or AIDS risk. Now, looking at the Wheel of Doom, you may think, oh no, my life is over. I'm going to die 20 years sooner, and this is all just terrible. Not necessarily. And that's why we're bringing this information to you, because if we know what's wrong, we can find ways to mitigate those risks. So there's hope. Don't feel that you don't have any, because we can't, healing is possible. So, now that we've given you all the bad news, let's take the ACEs test for you and see how many ACEs that you have. So for every yes that you answer, write that one down and then count up your, your score at the end. So number one, did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down or humiliate you or act in a way that made you afraid that you might be physically hurt? Did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you, or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? Number three, did an adult or person at least five years older than you ever touch or fondle you or have you touch their body in a sexual way or attempt to actually have oral, anal, or vaginal intercourse with you? Number four, did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special, or your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other, or support each other? Number five, did you often or very often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, and had no one to protect you, or your parents were too drunk or high to take care of you or take you to the doctor if you needed it? Number six, were your parents ever separated or divorced? Number seven, was your mother or stepmother often or very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at her, or sometimes often or very often kicked, bitten, hit with a fist, or hit with something hard, or ever repeatedly hit over at least a few minutes or threatened with a gun or knife? Number eight, did you live with anyone who was a problem drinker or alcoholic or who used street drugs? Number nine, was a household member depressed or mentally ill or did a household member attempt suicide? And number 10, did a household member go to prison? So now add up your yes answers and this is your ACE score. So don't freak out because there is hope, there is help. Some of the ways that we can uh, mitigate the outcomes of ACEs, to slow down, be positive, stay calm, take it easy, take care of yourself, go outside into nature, meditate, relax, breathe, have some fun. These are all ways that we can de-escalate the amygdala, which we're going to learn about next, because what's predictable is preventable. One way to describe this was put very nicely by Ryan North. Our brains are wired for connection, but trauma rewires them for protection. And that's why healthy relationships are difficult for wounded people. So 
Now that we realize that it's a thing, let's recognize the impacts of trauma on children's development. So here's a really stripped down version of the human brain, and there are three sections of it that we are most concerned about. The front is the prefrontal cortex, and it's responsible for logic, for reasoning, for choice, for understanding consequences, for thinking things through. The hippocampus is in the center and down. It's responsible for our emotional health regulation, for memory, for language development, for our ability to process things. And the amygdala, which is at the very base of the brain and in the most ancient part of the brain, it has one job and one job only. It's to keep you alive. It's the survival brain. You have no control over it. When you are threatened, the amygdala response, res the amygdala's response is automatic and instinctive. You can't control it once it's been activated. So here's an MRI of two brains. The brain on the left is a healthy, non-traumatized brain. The brain on the right is of a teenage boy who suffered significant neglect. So knowing what we know about the functions of the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, and the hippocampus, you can see that at the top, on the left-hand side, that prefrontal cortex is firing. There, this person's able to, uh, to reason things out, to understand consequences, and to use logic. But the child on the right, you can see that their prefrontal cortex is significantly diminished in its activity. The hippocampus in the center on the left, there's some uh, firing going on, but it's almost non-existent for the child on the right. And the amygdala on the left, while there is some activity in it, it's much more robust for the, the neglected and traumatized child on the right-hand side. We can tell from this MRI on the right that this child is tremendously amygdala driven. They have not a lot of control over what's happening and they obviously don't have a lot of memory or emotional regulation that's going on in the hippocampus, but the amygdala is the thing that's on fire. So understand that the brain develops from the bottom up and the inside out. Children cannot do more than their brains are ready for, and adverse childhood experiences can delay or stunt brain development, which is sometimes why we see kids who struggle in school, kids who have difficulty uh, making friends, kids who have difficulties with managing their emotions and their reactions. So what happens when the amygdala flares? There are generally three responses that one of three responses that happens. The first is fight. The body, when it's under stress and the amygdala is activated, will release stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline in order to give the individual the energy that they need in order to respond appropriately to keep them alive. So when the fight reflex happens, you might see some oppositional or argumentative behaviors, stubborn, challenging authority, dangerous, or violent. In the flight phase, they can seem distracted, hyperactive, attention-seeking, may run and hide, be avoidant in trying to get away from things. And the freeze, they're terrified. It can seem like they're lazy or inattentive or not trying, daydreaming, staring off into space. But in reality, it's the amygdala trying to keep them in place. Recognize that when the amygdala is activated, it's because this child is terrified. It's not because they're trying to hurt you or be defiant or ignore you or um, disrespect you in any way. Their amygdala is screaming at them that they're going to die and they have to get away. So give them 10 minutes. It takes the body 10 minutes for the, those stress hormones to get through the body and de-escalate the amygdala. So looking at the hallmarks of the fight, flight, or freeze uh, responses, we can see how easy it might be to misdiagnose a child who's displaying these behaviors as having attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder 
or bipolar, or oppositional defiant. These are absolutely real diagnoses that do happen, but sometimes they are misdiagnosed in traumatized children. So understand that when the amygdala is activated, the child is not willfully not listening to you. They can't. It's not that they won't. They can't listen to what you're saying and respond appropriately and stop. So unfortunately, because many people don't understand the amygdala-driven behaviors, some of these children end up in the school-to-prison pipeline. So we know that 66% of kids in the juvenile justice system have been diagnosed with trauma or behavioral disorders in childhood. 45% have learning disabilities and need special education because as we learned, if the uh, adverse childhood experiences continue, it can disrupt the children's ability to learn. We also know that 70% of these kids are serving time for nonviolent offenses, 70% have been diagnosed with substance abuse issues, and 26% have tried or have considered suicide. So what does trauma look like in children? It can be different than you think. There are sometimes physical signs like nausea, headaches, trembling, a general feeling of being ill. There can be emotional signals like flashbacks, memory gaps, fear, anger. These can be misinterpreted as not cooperating or being adversarial or acting aggressively, but really it's amygdala-driven behaviors over which they have no control. Traumatized children can be very hypervigilant or in a constant state of arousal, which can be seen as hostile or aggressive. For kids who have been traumatized, the biggest trigger is fear. And if they have learned that the world is not a safe place, they can be constantly looking around to see where the next threat is coming from. There was a study that came out about 15 years ago that talked about kids who had been abused as being experts at facial recognition in terms of emotion. They could look at people and see who was angry, who was sad, who was happy to assess the threats more accurately around them. You also want to be aware of kids who are disengaged or tuned out. Um, the emotions inside of them in dealing with their trauma can be so overwhelming that they just try to suppress it and not um, feel because feeling is too hard. Understand too that trauma can affect teenagers' brain development and impair the creation of coping strategies. For normal teenagers, they like to, they need to try on different personas to attach themselves to different groups, to try on um, who they're going to be and find out what the fit is for them. For kids who've been traumatized, this uh, appropriate developmental milestone can be disrupted and it can also impede efforts by authority figures to relate to them and gain their trust. For kids to transition through teenagerhood to adulthood, they need strong attachments with adults that they can trust, that they know that they can try on purple hair and not be in trouble, that they can wear a, a leather jacket and jeans and not be thought badly of. And not having those uh, trust and caring relationships can make it difficult to get through that time. Right? Exactly. So, now we realize it and we recognize it, we want to respond in a trauma-informed way. So, if you see that a child is out of control and you suspect that they're being amygdala-driven, what should we do? We want to wait at least 10 minutes before we engage because we know that with the cortisol and the adrenaline and the prefrontal cortex being offline, that this kid is not going to be able to comprehend what you're saying. If you're saying, stop, knock it off, behave, they can't process what you're saying. All of those 
uh, files need to reboot in the prefrontal cortex before they can start to comprehend you. That said, we also want to make sure that everybody's safety and security is addressed. If they're punching someone, clearly we can't let that go for 10 minutes, but we do need to make sure that everyone is safe. When the prefrontal cortex reboots and the cortisol and the adrenaline have washed out and the kid is ready to talk, we want to let them talk. Validate their feelings. Don't say, what's wrong with you? Say, what happened to you? And let them talk about what it is that triggered them. Also understand that for many kids who have experienced trauma, they have learned that the world is not a safe place and they expect things to go wrong. So we want to explain what's gonna happen next because not knowing is really difficult. If you don't know what happens next, find out. One of the most baffling parts of, of people who have endured trauma is the self-sabotage that they sometimes will do. Because their life experience has taught them that the world is not safe and that things um, are going to go badly for them, they will sometimes uh, self-sabotage if there's something good coming because at least they know when the bad thing is going to happen and they have control over it. But it can be really frustrating for those of us who are trying to help. So as we're looking for resources, recognize that there may be an element of self-sabotage that occurs. Some of the local resources that we have here in Somerset, Hunterdon, and Warren counties is Richard Hall, which is a mental health facility in Bridgewater, Ducks and Lions, uh, which is a uh, trauma-sensitive focused group that works primarily with schools in Somerville. Um, if you have any interest in learning more about that, Dr. Saden, who's the owner of Ducks and Lions, has several books out about the impacts of trauma on kids and how to help. Um, and they can be found on Amazon. One good one is The Teacher's Guide to Trauma. They're very quick reads, but they're also great resources for parents. Um, online, we have attachedtrauma.org. There's the Trauma Focused Cognitive Behavioral Therapy uh, membership group of people who are uh, licensed in that, and that's the tfcbt.org forward slash members. There's also Ace is too high. It's actually .com, not .org. That's my mistake. Uh, Traumasensitive.com. And all of the domestic violence shelters in the state of New Jersey have transitioned to this trauma-informed care model. So they are a really good resource as well. Recognize that whatever strategies that you try for kids, to have them be a part of it and let them have a say in what works for them. Because when they feel in control of what's happening, they feel empowered. So it's also important to recognize that every child is different in terms of the resiliency that they show in the face of negative experiences. And there is a recent study that came out that talked about kids being dandelions or orchids, that resiliency is largely biologically based as well. And kids who are dandelions can go through these terrible experiences and still come out on the other side. But for kids who are orchids, they need a lot more care, a lot more support in order to do as well. So how do we build resilience in children? Well, first let's define it. It's the ability to adapt to a changing environment, the ability to overcome challenges, and it can be genetic in origin. So building resilience, we have caregivers who model it, caregivers who understand normal child development, be really easy to get frustrated with the things that kids say and do if you don't recognize what's appropriate for that age and what's not. And to have good parenting skills. So if you haven't had the opportunity to engage in a, in a parenting class, this is a great time to do it. Also recognize that the number one, uh, the number one recovery tool that kids have from coming through adverse experiences is having caring, engaged relationships with nurturing and safe adults. So we want to build those kinds of relationships, whether it's with biological parents, with grandparents, with aunts, uncles, teachers, whoever it is, but to ensure that the 
kids know that there's somebody who cares about them and who has their back. Now, as we have talked about, sometimes kids and, and adults who've had these adverse experiences can be difficult to connect with because their brains are wired for protection instead of connection. The Nurtured Heart Training uh, talks about how to build those relationships and it is widely available and free in our community. I know that Family Support Organization has been focused on doing that too and offering them to whoever would like to take them. Um, another part of building resilience is social connections with others in their peer group, making sure that their own basic needs are met, giving them opportunities to build social and emotional skills, whether that's through clubs or teams or learning instruments or having opportunities to interact with peers, and having opportunities to succeed. All of us have a need not only to be connected with others, but to feel good about ourselves. And it can be hard to do that in circumstances where uh, trauma has happened. So let's find ways to help them build that. So to underscore everything we've talked about, understand that primarily for people who have experienced trauma, their primary need is to feel safe. And we do that through community engagement, through building positive, safe relationships, understanding the power of our words. It's not just what we say, but how we say it. Being able to monitor our own reactions and respond in trauma-sensitive ways. And these include regulating yourself. If you yourself have experienced trauma, it can be really difficult to not have your own amygdala flare. So be aware of what your triggers are and how to help. Learn best practices um, in responding. Personally, I'm a big fan of community policing because it gives officers an opportunity to build relationships with kids and for kids to build uh, positive relationships with law enforcement. And in areas where uh, community policing has been implemented, they've seen some really great results in terms of reduced crime and uh, reduced violence. And you wanna have empathy um, recognize that there's this internal struggle that's going on over which uh, traumatized individuals have very little control until the amygdala de-escalates. So be kind. And when we connect with a child, we have the power to change that child's life. And, and I believe that wholeheartedly to be true. So now we want to resist the urge to re-traumatize. And here's a great example of it. Billy's been in timeout 43 times already this month. It must be working really well. Clearly, it's not. So how do we avoid re-traumatizing children? Recognize that there are triggers, things like feeling a lack of control, experiencing unexpected changes, feeling threatened or attacked, feeling vulnerable or frightened, and feeling shame. All of these can trigger kids into feeling unsafe and to feeling like there's something wrong with them. So the four R's of trauma, we realize that ACEs exist. We've learned the signs, so we can recognize it. We're gonna respond in a trauma-informed way to help kids feel safe and build resilience. And we wanna be aware of our own actions to resist re-traumatization. So how are some ways that we can do that? We want to de-escalate the amygdala and bring kids back to a sense of normalcy. So there's been a lot of research that has shown that mindfulness and meditation um, paired with yoga are as effective as talk therapy and medication. That's really great and they're free. Meditation and mindfulness is really slowing things down, being very aware of what's around you and uh, having some control over where your thoughts are going. There are some really um, helpful videos online about meditation. There's some apps for your phone that can be very helpful. Exercise, uh, as I mentioned briefly, is another excellent way to de-escalate the amygdala. Yoga is one that we've talked about, but running, stretching, team sports, being in nature in and of itself, whether it's just taking a walk outside, getting good sleep, 
good nutrition, breathing exercises. I know that for me, when I start to um, escalate, uh, breathing exercises have been very, very helpful for me to bring things under control. Things like coloring, puzzles, art, the forms of expression for what's going on internally, if we externalize it and take it out of our brains. Making sure that we're having our mental health needs addressed through either trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, EMDR, emotional freedom tapping, um, which we have a short video on after this. Maintaining a regular schedule because we talked about that chaos and not knowing what's next is very scary for people who have the trauma background. We want to create the environment of trust at, at Paramount, whether it's keeping your word, watching what you say, communicating effectively, being honest, being helpful. All of those things will assist in that. And encouraging the development of healthy relationships with caring, engaged adults, the number one predictor of a child's recovery from trauma. So here are some visuals if you want to take a minute because some people are, are visual learners while others are auditory learners. But it's just kind of a recap of some of the things that we just talked about that can be very helpful to de-escalating the amygdala. So I mentioned briefly emotional freedom tapping. Um, I am trained as a clinician, but this is not anything that I ever learned about But I in school, but I have talked to a number of people who utilize freedom tapping and find it to be a very helpful resource. So I put a little graphic here on the right, but I have a little YouTube video which explains it more fundamentally. This video, I will teach you where the tapping points are, but to learn exactly how to do the tapping process, make sure you click the link below. So the first spot to tap on is the karate chop point, which is on the side of your hand underneath your pinky. And it could be either hand. The next point is the eyebrow point. So use your two fingers and tap where the hair of your eyebrow begins. Then you're gonna follow that bone until you're on the side of the eye, so right on that bone, continue following that bone until you're underneath the eye, underneath the nose, chin point, which is actually the crease between the lip and the chin, then the collarbone point. I like to use my whole hand and tap where a man's bow tie would lie. Then underneath the arm, for women, this is easy for us because it's right where your bra strap lies. For men, you can measure it because it's a hand width from your armpit. And we end at the top of the head. So that is the basic algorithm. When we do the tapping, we start with the setup statement. The setup statement is even though, and you state the problem. So even though I have this headache, even though I feel overwhelmed, I love and accept myself. A lot of people have resistance to this statement, but by doing the setup statement, what it does is it helps neutralize judgment we have about the problem. It really allows us to become more honest and go into the tapping process. So you say that three times, then you continue tapping on the rest of the points while saying how you feel. It's not so much about the words, but it's about bringing up the emotions that you want to clear. It's about being honest. So let's do a very quick example. If you are scared to speak in public, you're scared you're gonna forget your words, you're nervous about a meeting, you can simply tap on the side of the hand and say, even though I'm so scared I'm gonna forget my words, I love and accept myself. Even though I'm so scared I'm gonna mess up, I love and accept myself. Even though I'm so nervous about this meeting, I love and accept myself. Then tap on the rest of the points while just talking about your anxiety. Again, you want to bring it up so you're able to clear it. So eyebrow point. So nervous about this meeting. Side of the eye. This anxiety. Under the eye. All of this pressure. Underneath the nose. What if something goes wrong? Chin. All of this anxiety. Collarbone, what if I say the wrong thing? Under the arm, all of this anxiety. 
top of the head, all of this pressure. So what I was just doing then was giving a voice to what I was feeling. It's just that simple. You can pretend you're speaking to a close friend and complaining about the problem. Give yourself the opportunity to be honest with yourself and stimulate these after pressure points and you will be surprised by the results. So in summary, here's the best thing that you can do. Build an environment where all children feel valued, safe, respected, and heard. It goes a long way to de-escalating the amygdala and helping traumatized children move forward in a healthy way. I love Mr. Rogers. I did not value him as much when I was young, but this is the screensaver on my computer, and I love these words. We live in a world in which we need to share responsibility. It's easy to say, it's not my child, not my community, not my world, not my problem. Then there are those who see the need and respond, I consider those people my heroes. Thank you.